I'll give the floor to Satya and Chris. Oh, thank you, Megan. So, um, good morning, all. Um, so, welcome to the ninth invited lecture of Interport 2021 uh, to be delivered by Dr. Christopher McMean from University of Oxford, and he will be talking about fluid fluid phase separations in a soft porous medium. To briefly introduce Chris, uh, so Chris is an associate professor in the Department of Engineering Science at Oxford. He earned his PhD in the mechanical engineering from uh, MIT USA in the early 2012, after which he was a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University, jointly working with John Wetlofer and Eric Dufrens until joining Oxford in late 2013. He leads the uh, research group or named Poros Poro Mechanics Lab at Oxford University, which is an interdisciplinary team working with engineers, physicists, mathematicians, and geoscientists. The kind of work they do, it's a wide range of work where they are interested to understand flow deformations and reactions in porous medium with applications in geomechanics <coughs> and surface, surface engineering. And uh, in their research, they look into the mathematical modeling, high resolution experiments and also numerical simulation. So with this, I would uh, give the floor to Chris and hand over to him to give his session talk. Thank you. Thank you, Satya. Just uh, get set up here. Yeah, so since uh, Chris is setting off his things, I ask all the attendees if they have any question, they just feel free to put in the question and answer chat box, which I will pass on to Chris at the end of his talk. So you feel free to put your question anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Can you uh, see my screen and hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So uh, so thanks very much for the nice introduction, Satya. Um, so I'm, I'm Chris McMahon from Oxford. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work we've been doing on fluid fluid phase separation in a soft porous medium. And I'm going to use this as an excuse to frame a lot of the work that we've been doing around soft porous media uh, in terms of um, sort of why we think fluid fluid phase separation in particular is a very relevant process to these sorts of problems. Uh, so before I lose track of things and I forget, uh, I want to thank the people who are involved in this work. So this is um, more or less, I think, a uh, um, a grid of everybody who's been involved in ways big or small, um, maybe most notably my collaborator Sung Yan Lee at the University of Minnesota. So she's been involved uh, in a lot of this work since more or less the very beginning. Uh, and also, I'd say uh, my student Oliver Pollan, whose work I'm going to talk about at the very end, and uh, the three students Jeremy, Robin, and Fung, who are responsible for some of the experiments that I'm going to show you, as well as James. He did one of the experiments too. Uh, and so this work. Uh, as I'll come back to briefly at the end, is funded by the European Research Council and also the Royal Society. So uh, the first thing that I want to do is define for you what I or my definition of a soft porous medium. So poro mechanics generally uh, is the coupling between flow and deformation in a porous material. And in principle, this coupling can be two way. So deformation can drive fluid flow, but fluid flow can also drive deformation. And I think it's useful to keep in mind that the, the first version of this coupling could be a one-way coupling in the sense that deformation drives fluid flow even in very stiff porous materials. So if you have a very stiff porous material and you crush it, the fluids are gonna move out of the way uh, because they don't really have a choice. However, uh, fluid flow can drive deformation only in very special circumstances. So that's a situation where the medium and the fluids are actually two-way coupled or fully coupled. And so that's the scenario that I really want to focus on here. So I think uh, it's also useful to introduce a way of quantifying the, how deformable a porous medium is. And the thing I like to think about is what, what I like to call the deformability of a porous medium or a porous media system. And this really measures the strength of this two-way coupling that I'm talking about. So I'll define the deformability D as the ratio of a characteristic pressure delta P that the fluids are applying to the solid to the characteristic resistance E that the solid has to deformation. And that resistance can come from elasticity, it can come from plasticity, it can come from confining stress, it doesn't really matter for purposes of this discussion. The point is, it's roughly speaking, how hard you have to push in the solid before it will move 
And so the, the fluid pressure delta P can come from various places, but let's think about two in particular. So the first one is viscosity. So if I have a flow of a single phase through a porous medium, then there's going to be a viscous pressure gradient associated with that. And the size of the pressure difference associated with that flow, I can estimate using the Darcy flux, the fluid viscosity, the permeability, and sort of the characteristic size of my system. And then I can use that to construct a viscous deformability. And so if this number is large, then it means that the forces that the fluid applies to the solid through this viscous pressure are large relative to the stiffness, let's say, of the solid, which means that I expect the solid to be highly deformable. And if, the, if this number is small, then it means that I expect the solid to be very weakly deformable or maybe even effectively rigid. Similarly, we can estimate the strength of pressures due to capillarity as with capillary pressure. Uh, and if I take the ratio of the capillary pressure to my resistance to deformation, then I get a capillary deformability, which again has the same interpretation. So a large capillary deformability means that capillary forces can deform the solid, and a small capillary deformability means that they can't, or they can't very much. And I'll just note that the ratio of these two quantities actually gives the balance of viscosity to capillarity, because the, the solid part cancels out, which is then more or less the classical capillary number. So there's something familiar lurking in these two things. And so I think this is nice because it then gives us a way of deforming what we mean when we say, of, deforming, of defining what we mean when we say uh, a soft porous material. So soft porous media are those that are highly deformable. And what that means is that the, either the viscous deformability or the capillary deformability or both are large or at least not small. And so the, I think it's really important to keep in mind that this property of softness is then because of the way we've defined it, it's not just a property of the material, it's a property of the system. And so we can make a porous medium more or less deformable by changing its stiffness, but we can also make a porous media system more or less deformable by changing, say, the flow rate of fluid that we drive through it or the viscosity of the fluids that we're pushing through it, because those increase or decrease the abilities of the fluids to deform the solid. And these soft porous materials are ubiquitous. So we have things like soils and sediments, things like biological cells and tissues, things like gels and filters, and I'll come back to a bunch of other examples later in the talk. And so that's uh, the reason why we care about trying to understand how these systems work. So my favorite example, which I think I've shown in almost every talk I've given for the past decade, more or less, so apologies if you've seen it before, but I, I still really like it and I've seen it many times, um, is this example of fluid flow through a kitchen sponge. So this is, a, I think, a really nice example of fluid flow, or let's say, of what happens inside a soft porous medium. So on the left, we're looking at the sponge from the side. It's sitting on top of a rigid mesh, and it's contained within a rigid cylinder. Uh, and the mesh is permeable, so it allows the fluid to flow through, but not the sponge. And you can see someone's gone and drawn these tick marks on it with uh, like a black marker. So initially in the relaxed state, those tick marks are uniformly spaced, more or less. Uh, if they're non-uniform, it's because someone wasn't very careful with their marker. Uh, and then what we can do first is we can compress that sponge with a piston. So this is a mechanical compression. The tick marks get closer together, but they remain uniformly spaced. So that's a uniform state of stress and strain. And the fluid inside the sponge has had to move out of the way in order to accommodate that deformation. But that flow didn't really have anything to say about the deformation. So this is the sort of one-way version of the coupling that I was talking about, where the motion of the solid drives the fluid. However, if we then take that piston away and drive a steady fluid flow through the sponge from top to bottom, you can see that the sponge also compresses, but that, that compression is now highly non-uniform. So the sponge is much more compressed at the bottom than, is, than it is at the top. And that's because each cross section of the sponge has to support essentially the total viscous drag on all of the material above it. And so the top bit of the sponge doesn't really have any material above it, so it doesn't support much viscous drag at all. Whereas the bottom of the sponge has to support the viscous drag on the entire structure. And so that means that the bottom is carrying much more stress and is therefore much more strained than the material at the top. So this is an example of the second form of coupling that I was talking about, where the fluid is actually driving the solid. And the fact that you can see that the flow is strongly deforming the material tells you that if I were to calculate a viscous deformability for this system, it would be large. So this is a soft porous material. And so usually that's the only thing that I wanna say about this, uh, about this picture, but I, uh, for purposes of this talk, I wanna frame it slightly differently, which is um, what we'd really like to do is to be able to predict, for example, 
the distribution of tick marks on this sponge using a mathematical model. And the reason is, again, that soft porous materials come up all the time in engineering and natural systems. And we'd like to be able to predict how those systems are going to behave. So we want a predictive model for the deformation of this material under both compressive loads or steady fluid flows. And so the question then I'd like to ask is, how do you characterize the properties of this material that you need in order to make that prediction? And I, I should also say before I leave this slide that there are actually quite a few papers where people have been sucked into studying these sort of simple sponge problems, as I like to call them. There's, there were a flurry in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, one of which is where this particular picture comes from. But there have been a few since then as well, um, including a, a theoretical one by me. Uh, and I think the reason that people sort of keep coming back to this problem is precisely because it's such a nice illustration of the, the interesting features of soft porous materials. So, uh, so this is what I said before about the, the solid driving the fluid in this case, whereas the fluid is driving the solid in this case. So this is uh, data from one of those sponge papers. It's actually from one of the more recent ones um, because I think they have the nicest figures. So what they're doing is characterizing the properties of their soft porous material. And the way they do that is they're applying a load to the material. So that's the stress. This is the effective stress that they're applying to the porous skeleton. So this is, a, this is like the picture in the middle of the ones that I just showed you where they're using a piston to squash the material. And they're doing it quasi-statically. So in, in very small increments. And they're measuring the strain, which is a measure of the bulk deformation of the material. So how much you know, the macroscopic length gets shorter. Uh, and then they're plotting the stress or the effective stress and the strain. Uh, and now just keep in mind, I'm not gonna talk about this in detail, but there is a, a direct kinematic relationship between the strain and the porosity, uh, which is very easy to write down. And so as a result, you can think of this as effective stress versus porosity. The two are essentially interchangeable in a 1D system. So I think the interesting thing about this data is that it tells us a whole bunch of things about the material. So the first is that the material is very soft. So you can see that the stresses here are order of kilopascals for strains that are order tens, even not so far away from 100%. Uh, so this is a very soft material. It's, it's extremely squishy. Uh, the stress versus strain is nonlinear. So you can see for a linear elastic material, this would be a straight line, although linear elasticity is clearly not valid for such large strains. So presumably for very small strains down in the lower left corner of this material is probably weakly, you know, linearly elastic. Uh, but over large strains, it's very nonlinear. Um, it is elastic. So when you deform the material, it returns to its initial state uh, when you release the load, modulo a small offset in strain, which is unrecoverable. Uh, and speaking of unrecoverable strains, uh, it's also hysteretic. So you can see that during the initial compression stage, so as you increase the load, the material deforms and follows this curve here. And then when you release the load and let it relax, you follow this lower curve down here as the stress decreases and you, as you decrease the stress and the strain therefore decreases. And then in subsequent cycles, you follow this hysteresis loop. So I think in uh, multi-phase flow through porous media, we're used to thinking about hysteresis quite a lot and path dependence in the way that we uh, push fluids through the medium. But here, this hysteresis is actually coming from the rheology of the solid, not from the fluids. So this is pretty complicated behavior from the solid side of things. The other thing that you need to characterize is the fluid flow. And so what they also did was they measured the permeability of the material as a function of the strain. And this is a little bit tricky. So the sneaky thing that they're doing here is that they're actually compressing the material by a certain amount just like they did on the, in the plot on the left. And in that situation, the state of stress and strain within the material is uniform because it's being mechanically compressed quasi-statically. And then what you do is you measure the permeability by driving a very slow fluid flow through the material. And you rely on the fact that the fluid flow doesn't contribute additional deformation on top of what you're imposing. And so as a result, the pore structure is uniform and is known it's controlled by you because you're squashing the material. And then all you're measuring is what is the pressure drop as fluid flows very slowly through that pore structure. And by imposing a slow fluid flow, what you're really doing is you're cranking down the deformability of the system. Because remember, deformability depends on not just the properties of the material, but also the flow rate and the fluid viscosity and the size of your system, et cetera. So therefore, what we're doing is we're taking advantage of the fact that I can get rid of this second version of coupling where flow deforms the material by having a very small deformability 
And that allows me to use the first version of poor mechanical coupling where I squash the material to impose a certain pore structure uh, in order to impose a pore structure that's uniform and then measure the, the effective permeability of that particular configuration. And if I do that for a bunch of different strains or a bunch of different porosities, if you prefer to think of it that way, uh, then I can measure the permeability of the material. So maybe two, <clears throat> two interesting things about the permeability. The first is that it's quite high. So this is 10 to the minus nine meters squared is the scale we're talking about here. So this is like thousands of Darcy's. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, additionally, although it does change by quite a lot, so it, so it decreases by a factor of say 10 or a little bit more than an order of magnitude over this range of strains, this range of strains is huge. So we're going from zero to 80%. So we're deforming the, the, the material by a lot. Uh, and the fact that the permeability only changes by about a factor of 10 in that range is an indication of the fact that actually the permeability is not that strongly coupled to the pore structure in this particular geometry, which you can see if you think about the pore structures. This, so this is sort of a, a small scale image of the pore structure in this sponge. And the reason permeability is not so strongly coupled to the deformation is because we're deforming it in one direction, but the deformation in that direction doesn't necessarily close the pores that the fluid is primarily flowing through. So it's collapsing the pore structure along one axis, but that axis is not the sort of the direction that the fluids need to flow through, right? We're not decreasing the cross section that the fluids are passing through. And that means that the coupling between deformation and permeability is actually a lot weaker than it would otherwise be. But in any case, okay, so now we've measured the effective stress as a function of porosity. We've measured the permeability as a function of porosity. And so in principle, we now need to know everything, we now know everything we need to know about this material to use a macroscopic model. So this is one such macroscopic model derived from large deformation poroelasticity. It's fairly standard. There's, I'm not gonna go into the details, um, but you, in this particular setup, you can write the, the whole problem as a single nonlinear PDE in the porosity. Uh, and that PDE has these material properties in it. So here's the permeability that we just measured. Here's the effective stress or its derivative, um, but its derivative with respect to porosity. So this is the thing you can also calculate from the curves that I just showed you. And then you can solve this model. It's just one thing to note is that this, uh, this, these results are for a geometry where the sponge is on its side and the flow is going from left to right, uh, just to confuse you. And these, are, these uh, particular solutions are from a paper that I wrote back in 2016. Um, and I don't want to dwell on the details, but the point is that you can solve the problem and you can, if you like, predict the distribution of tick marks. So that's, uh, this is the displacement field, this sort of second row. Uh, and the parabolic shape of the displacement field, so high displacement at the left, zero displacement at the right where the sponge is sitting on the mesh, that's what gives you this characteristic non-uniform distribution of tick marks. And then because you can solve the problem, you can play games with the material properties and the amount of non-linearity, and that changes sort of the general shape of these curves a little bit. This is the porosity field, which, um, which is linear. Uh, sorry, the different curves here are for different pressures, so different driving strengths, uh, and these are steady states. So you get different linear porosity fields from a linear model and weakly nonlinear porosity fields uh, from, you know, as you introduce various nonlinearities into the model. But the point is that we can solve this problem. So we have everything we need to know. And in some sense, we've now been able to make macroscopic predictions. I'm not going to get into comparing those predictions with the actual deformation of the sponge, but, you know, people in these sponge papers, that's what they do. Um, and it works reasonably well, except for the fact that sponges are actually very sort of painful materials to deal with for a variety of reasons. But... That aside, it works pretty well. Uh, and so then the question is, well, is that it? So have we solved the problem? We wanted to characterize flow through a soft porous material and model it, and we, it seems that we've done that. So let's look at a more complicated situation. And uh, just to fix ideas, I wanna talk about gas migration through soft granular media in particular, so a specific problem. Uh, and this is something that happens in seabeds and lake beds with regard to gas seeps, uh, also industrial waste ponds, and also even uh, it's relevant to volcanic eruptions. And I'm not gonna get into the details of any of these scenarios, except to say that they all involve gas bubbles migrating through a water saturated granular material, which is water wet. So the gas is the non-wetting phase. Uh, and you can see here in this video of the seabed that these bubbles uh, or the gas, let's say, tends to pop out of the surface of that granular material as bubbles. Uh, and so the question that I would like to ask is, well, what's going on inside the material that leads to these gas bubbles coming out the top? 
And if you know something about the rate of methane generation, so the methane is being generated by uh, bacterial activity, most likely uh, somewhere deeper in the seabed. If you know the rate of methane generation, what can you say about the rate of methane escape and maybe the methane content of the sediment in this case? Um, so that's the problem that I want to think about. Uh, and we'll do it in a very simple way. So here's a, a box. It's got grains and liquid inside. We're going to inject gas in the bottom. And we're going to look at what happens inside and what comes out the top. And this is all in the presence of gravity. So here's three experiments for three different conditions. Uh, I don't want to get into the details of the experiments. The point is uh, it's a quasi 2D flow cell with a monolayer of particles. The particles are squishy and slippery, so they move around quite a lot and they're sort of easy to push around. Uh, and the only thing we're going to vary is the amount of space we give them. So on the left, the particles are fairly squashed. And then as we go from left to right, we're giving the particles more and more space to move around. So we're squashing them less. And I'm going to refer to how squashed they are as the confinement. So these are strongly confined on the left and weakly confined on the right. Uh, and we can quantify confinement with literally just the height of the flow cell, H. So as we go here from left to right, H is increasing which is decreasing confinement, or with the solid fraction, so one minus the porosity, um, which is traveling in the opposite direction. So this is a high solid fraction. And then as we give the, the thing more space, keeping the amount of solid fixed, then the solid fraction decreases. So then what we're just gonna do is inject gas in the bottom and see what we get. So when the porous material is fairly squashed, what we get is pore invasion. So the gas enters in the bottom, it propagates through the pore space, and it escapes at the top. So this is more or less a standard porous media flow. So if you've ever seen a two-phase fluid flow into porous medium, it often looks a lot like this. Um, and you can imagine, this is not the setup you would probably choose, but you can imagine using a system like this to measure things like relative permeability or capillary pressure. So the sorts of properties that you would want to know about your porous material. So then the question is, well, what happens as we um, reduce the confinement or reduce the compression or whatever you want to think of it. And I just want to remind you that uh, this is exactly the scenario that people were doing with the sponges uh, a few slides ago. So what they were doing was changing the amount of compression and measuring how the sponge conducted fluid flow. So as we change the amount of compression, so we reduce it a little bit, what you see is, well, something totally different. So the way the fluid moves through the porous medium is completely different from what it did when the medium was heavily squashed. Uh, and that, uh, if you're hoping that the approach that, that people took for the soft sponges was going to work in this case, then this is your first sign that, that there's a problem. So you should be thinking, uh-oh, like this is not, this system is not gonna be easy to characterize in the way that the previous one was. Uh, and if we reduce the confinement even more, what you see is yet another behavior which is that now the gas actually forms macroscopic bubbles. So here we had something that looked kind of like pathways or fractures, and here we actually have bubbles uh, where the gas is moving up through the medium as if it's a fluid. Uh, so this is really a problem because remember the crux of the thing that we were doing with the sponge was that we were imposing a fairly simple, controlled, uniform pore structure by squashing the material and then looking how fluids move through that pore structure. Here, we tried to impose a, a simple uniform pore structure, but the interaction of the fluid with the solid meant that pore structure became non-uniform. And in fact, you can calculate the roughly the porosity field in these systems. And there is also a gradient in porosity uh, as you go from bottom to top in the same way that there would be for those sponge problems. But here, it's more complicated. And there's also lots of other things going on because the gas is pushing the solid all over the place. So the challenge, or the reason this is not working, is capillarity. So this was our squishy filter that we talked about a few minutes ago. Here are some other examples of situations where capillarity is relevant to flow through a soft porous material. So we have, you know, imbibition into kitchen sponges, uh, which start dry. We have actually the fur of seals. Uh, and the thinking is that the fur of seals start to dry when the seals are on land. But when they dive into the water, you expose that fur to water. And then actually some of the air gets trapped within the fur, within the pore space, and that helps to keep the seal warm in very cold water. Uh, so that is uh, in some sense a soft porous material, and that's exactly how these people tried to model it. Uh, and then there's the sort of volcanoes that I talked about briefly on the other slide. So the issue in all these scenarios is that capillary forces are themselves strong enough to deform the solid. So although we can control the viscous deformability, 
we can't really control the capillary deformability. And in these systems and the poor and the, the packing of beads that I showed you before, the capillary deformability is itself large. Uh, and so that means that we no longer are able to impose a pore structure. So how can we characterize the flow properties? Uh, let's see, I'm going <laughs> to, I have a so I'm going to actually skip a little ways. Let me give you the key point. So uh, the key point is that we think it's really useful to actually think of these processes as phase separation. So this is the injection of a gas bubble into a packing of squishy beads. And what we're doing is we're actually squashing the gas bubble within the packing. So the way that we like to think about this is, well, the gas can choose between two different states. It can either invade the pore space or it can open a macroscopic cavity. And here it's in a macroscopic cavity until we squash it and then it invades the pore space. So the gas is choosing which of these states it wants to occupy. And in general, it prefers to be in the lowest energy state. But which of those two states is the lowest energy depends on the confining stress. So clearly as we increase the confining stress, the gas changes which choice uh, it prefers. And so you can think of the confining stress as a thermodynamic state variable. So we're imposing a stress on the system and we're looking at how the system responds. And you can think of these two states as phases. So one gas phase is in bubbles and the other gas phase is gas in the pore space. So really the opening or collapse of gas cavities in the porous material is a process of phase separation. And that provides a lens through which we can view and then try to model this process which we can then hopefully use to loop back and actually try to say something quantitative uh, about how the fluids are moving through our box. Uh, so now I'm gonna skip forward a little bit more and not burden you with the math, but I will say that if you're interested in the modeling side of that problem, then you should check out the talk by my student Oliver, who's been spending quite a bit of uh, the first couple of years of his PhD thinking about exactly this process of phase separation. So uh, have a look in the schedule. His talk was the other day uh, and is available to watch. He goes through this in much more detail. Uh, so I will conclude by saying, so the, the presence of strong capillary deformability in a soft porous material is a challenge for characterization. So the sorts of tricks that people use to characterize flow through squishy porous media in the presence of a single fluid phase don't work when the capillary deformability is large because it prevents you from imposing a simple uniform pore structure and measuring flow properties. The, the pore structure is inherently coupled to where the fluids are doing. And as a result, you lose that ability to control the problem. And so you have to actually model in a little more detail what's happening inside your box. The non-wetting phase, so what, I think one of the most striking features of these systems when the capillary deformability is large is that the, the non-wetting phase can choose between two states, pores and cavities, and how it makes that choice, again, we, we like to think of as a process of phase separation. Um, as Oliver can tell you in more detail, we have developed a model for that problem, which is a three-phase mixture model based on a phase field framework. And we've done a lot of benchmarking and analysis. And the idea is that we'd like to use this model to help close the loop uh, of understanding the constitutive behavior of these squishy porous media. We're doing a lot more experiments. We're also thinking about things like solute transport and mixing. So I'll refer you to my student Matilda's poster uh, which is on deformation-driven solute transport in soft porous media, uh, which is also available in the conference. And all of this is under the umbrella of a project funded by the ERC on really trying to get a handle on how deformation, flow, and transport interact uh, in the context of soft porous, porous materials. So and with that, I will stop here and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Chris, uh, for this nice talk. So uh, there is one question in the chat by Hassan Mahani. So he said it's a great talk. And then he mentions the confinement effects, uh, confinement affects the stress strain behavior. Material gets hardened if confining stress is applied or on or the boundaries are rigid. Did you account these things in your model anyway? Yeah, so the, so um, that's absolutely true. So for for let's say any solid material, the, the more you squash it, uh, it's sort of effective material properties change unless you're working in linear elasticity. That is, um, it's particularly true of granular materials. So for a granular material, the effective say stiffness and shear strength are completely dependent on the confining stress. And that's all stuff that you can account for uh, in your model for the rheology of the solid. But that's essentially a solid mechanics problem. So it doesn't have too much to do with how the fluid interacts with the solid, except that you need to know about it. Yeah, excellent question.
Okay, uh, thanks, Chris, for answering this. I mean, we don't have any more questions in the question answer, and also we are almost uh, the timing is end. So, I thanks Chris once again for this nice talk, and to the audience, if you have anything for further discussion, you can always contact Chris over email in in his Oxford things, which is available in his website. I'm sure Chris will be happy to answer and clarify things if you have anything in your mind. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, there is a one more question. So since we are still here, yeah, I mean, it's not question. This is to, uh, sort of comment that it's a fantastic work by is comments from Matthias Winter. It's a fantastic work and thanks for showing all this to us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Uh, Matthias here. Uh, I wasn't sure whether I could actually speak here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure either. <laughs> of course, um, sitting behind your computer, uh, <clears throat> sorry, sitting behind your computer alone uh, is difficult to get feedback, but I just want to Applause for the uh, for the very nice um, movies. So, uh, so, so uh, thank, thank you. <coughs> Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. If there, if there is a time, this is th those movies that you showed. Th those are semi two dimensional uh, models. So, uh, so it's uh, uh, you're talking about like the gas bubbles, the gas propagating yeah. up through these blue. Yeah. So they're experiments, um, but they're Quasi 2D, exactly. So it's a, uh, it's like a planar packing of particles and fluid. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I guess in 3D, it's it would probably behave the same, wouldn't it? I mean, we've done some tentative experiments in 3D, and qualitatively, you see the same sorts of things. So you see gas, you know, gas pockets and and whatnot. The, it's a little more complicated um, because you you then get the possibility to get a much stronger distinction between say a gas bubble which would be more spherical and again and something more like a fracture which would be a planar feature and you can really see the the planarity of the fracture like features when you're in three dimensions in 2d it's sort of like you know a fracture is like a narrow bubble and then a, a an actual bubble is more round right um, yeah. but, it, but in principle in principle you see the same sorts of things yeah because i can imagine that the uh pseudo two 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 dimensional um model uh, that you have actually influences by the boundaries the top and bottom boundary um mm. the cover covering sites that would actually influence the uh, the system a little bit yeah so one thing uh one thing that i had to <laughs> that i had to come to terms with when i started working on these sorts of problems is that uh for the solid mechanics part of the problem the boundary conditions are incredibly important so the the solid really feels what you do on all sides uh, and so it, it's absolutely true that that in 2D and in 3D, the you know the top and bottom boundaries and the lateral boundaries, what you do there really matters for the response of the material. But I guess um, coming at this from the perspective of characterization, you know, if you wanted to think of say the classical core testing, for example, where you have a sample and you want to push fluids through to measure its properties, you do need to have a fairly confined sample so that your experiment is well controlled. You need to do something at the boundaries, so that something could be. Uh, constant stress, or it could be an imposed displacement. So in this case, you know, zero displacement is probably the simplest thing that you can do. Um, I'm, I'm open to arguments that an imposed stress might be better, but it's more complicated in a lot of ways, especially experimentally. So if you then have confinement, different confinement in two directions, mm -hmm. that would then make it even more complicated, right? Yeah. I'm just yeah. thinking, I, I'm not aware of this topic, wasn't aware of this topic uh, really, so I'm just thinking out loud here. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. So the um, the this particular material that I showed here, the packing of squishy particles. So they're very slippery. They don't have very much shear strength, and as a result, they're really bad at supporting anisotropic states of stress. Mm -hmm. So you know, with uh, with an elastic solid, if you squash it in one direction, it will typically bulge a bit in the other direction. But you can have a very anisotropic state of stress nonetheless. Um, but for these particles, if you sort of squash them more in one direction than the other, then they'll just kind of rearrange until the stress is isotropic again. So you oh. can't really do that with these, but certainly in other sorts of porous materials, yes, you could absolutely have 
sort of different confinement in one axis than the other. Uh, and that's actually something that my student Matilda is going to be doing some thinking about in the context of solute transport. So for example, looking at how when you squash a porous material containing a blob of dye, how that blob of dye spreads as the pore structure changes around it and how that spreading depends on what the flow boundary conditions are on the various sides relative to the uh, sort of deformation boundary conditions. Right. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, once again. And Matthias, sorry for calling you Matthias because I <laughs> missed <laughs> your name. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think the time for this session is is over, isn't it? Oh, we're running late already, anyway. Yeah, we are running six minutes late, or more. Yeah, six minutes. Yeah, I think there wasn't something else starting immediately, but there will be something else starting relatively soon. So we probably should move on. And I think there's yeah. um, I think there's another there was, session that actually started a moment or two ago, just not in this room. <laughs> there was a notification about a poster session, which just yeah. uh, popped up. Yeah, so we should probably wrap up, but I'm happy, Matthias, if you want to chat more, um, I'm happy to, you know, we can schedule a meeting or exchange emails or whatever. But regardless, thank you for, <laughs> for your question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really working in this particular field, but um, um, sure. But as I said, it's uh, it's nice to learn about something new. And um, it's, yeah, you showed very nice wor work altogether with the movies and <laughs> so uh, a nice yeah. complete thank package. Yeah. And there's more, a lot more to do, so that's good. Indeed. Yes, there's a lot. There's a lot more to do. I, I like pretty movies, too. <laughs> it really helps to, to sell a story. Yes. All right. Yeah. We'll, we may see each other again uh, somewhere else in a poster session or uh, another. Sounds uh, good. Yeah, sounds story. good. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks, thanks Tatiana, everyone. for allowing us to yeah, continue you. talking. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. So let's uh, wrap up this session. And yeah, thank you. Thanks, yeah. Satya. Uh, thank you, and I, I'm going to end this session and so that everyone could close the, the, the Zoom meeting. Okay. Okay. Thank you, okay. guys. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay.